How do you take a vision and turn it into reality? You start at the beginning. You build until things come alive. The building turns into becoming. The becoming begins to transform. And now you've reached the moment when you become the movement. Three Sundays ago, we became the movement. Three Sundays ago, we changed our name, but it wasn't just a name change. I don't believe in doing things just to do them. We did it because on that Sunday, we stopped building an American church. And I want you to hear me. I don't mean that as a cliche. You know, we, we change names, we do different things, and we say well, God is doing a new thing, but we're just doing a newer version of the old thing. But three weeks ago, we became the movement. We stopped being God's house. And it signaled a change in philosophy. A house is something that's stationary. It's something that's just there. And we wanted to be something more than just some, something that just you came to and hung out at. And we wanted to be the actual move of God. And I hear people talk about this all the time. They go, I want to be the move of God. I want to be the move of God. And if you're praying up here, don't worry. Just keep praying. Just keep ministering. It doesn't bother me. So y'all, eyes over here. There ain't nothing wrong happening over there. That's good. Good. Doesn't even phase me. Just keep doing what you're doing. But we decided that we were done doing the church thing. And I know you're here on Sunday morning. You go, well, but I'm here on Sunday. And, I'm, and, and it looks like. We're just doing the same thing that everyone else does. Now, I don't know if everybody else does this, but, but, but we, we just let God do what God's going to do. But coming together as a body of Christ is something that should always be a part of who we are. In fact, the early church didn't do less of this. They did more of it. If you read in Acts, they did this every single day at about 3 o'clock p.m. Every day they did this. So being an Acts church doesn't mean that we stop doing Sunday morning. It just means if you really want to take it literally and you really want to get, get, get completely authentic with it, we wouldn't take away Sunday mornings. We would just add Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And you go, but Chris, that would mean church would take up my life. Yeah, because the Acts church, church was life. You didn't know how to live apart from God. You didn't know how to do it. Just as much as every day I could count on getting up and going to work, I could count on getting up and going and worshiping with, with my fellow believers and my family. And I hear it said all the time, we want to move of God. We want to move of God. We want to move of God. But how many of us are actually willing to do what it takes to be that move? And last week I talked about breaking the honor code. That the kingdom is built on honor. If you don't know how to honor, you can't be part of the kingdom. And in fact, if you don't know how to honor, whatever you fail to honor will eventually leave your, li your, wife, uh, your life. I'm sorry, I said wife. If you're a man and you're married, life, wife, they're synonymous, right? <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Your life. If you don't know how to treat your wife, she will eventually leave your life. If you don't know how to treat your spouse, your husband, he will eventually leave your life. If you don't know how to honor the job that God gave you, so you call in to work all the time, or you go in with a bad attitude, eventually you'll get fired and that job will leave your life. Anything you fail to honor will leave your life. And you don't get a choice on whether or not you're going to live life with honor or not honor. The only choice you have is, is who or what you're going to honor. And in the end, the most important one that you can honor is Him. But everything God brings you is a good gift for you. It's something meant 
to help you, not hurt you. Every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of light. It's not that God gives you good gifts and doesn't give you bad gifts. It's that everything God gives you is good. Let me say that again. Every good and every perfect gift comes from God. It's not that he's choosing and going, well, that's good and perfect, and I'm going to give it to you. It's anything he gives you, whether it's good or seemingly bad, everything he gives you is good and perfect. You could, you could pray and say, God, I'm ready for promotion, and you lose your job, and you did nothing to deserve it. And you go, God, how could that happen to me? But maybe, just maybe, losing your job was the gift God gave you. And you go, well, that wasn't good or perfect. But it is good and perfect because losing that job that you did nothing to lose when you said, I'm ready for promotion, maybe passing through him, a job loss became good and perfect because it lined you up to get you out of a career that you hated. And it jettisoned you forward to open up your options to choose something that you truly love. Everything God gives you is good and perfect, even if it doesn't feel like it. And, and, and because of that, we have to learn to honor every season in life because if I don't honor it, I will get nothing out of it. And I talked about Stephen last week, about the story of Stephen getting stoned and how that encounter that is recorded in Acts about him being stoned all you saw everywhere was honor. Jesus standing in honor of Stephen's sacrifice at the right hand of the Father. Stephen turning his eyes in honor of the one that he was giving his life for. Saying, I'm not going to look at my circumstance. I'm going to look to him. Men honoring Saul standing there giving the orders, laying down their coats before him. Saul standing there honoring the orders of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Pharisees and Sadducees, saying to stone him, honor everywhere. And you only have a choice of who you're going to honor. Saul standing there, stoning the move of God, or the catalyst, Stephen, getting ready to explode the move of God from a citywide movement to a worldwide movement with his death. You have a choice today who you're going to serve. You have a choice today whether you're going to be a catalyst in the move of God and by honoring and looking to Christ or you're going to become a killer of the move of God by honoring the things of this world. That's the only choice you have. And some of us out of our mouths are saying, I want to be a catalyst for the move of God. But with our actions and with our lives and what we're serving and what we're honoring, we are killing the very movement that we're speaking out of our mouths. If there's not a move of God today, it's not because we haven't prayed enough. It's not because we haven't worshipped enough. It's not because we haven't done enough. You know what? You know why there may not be a move of God today? It's because... Maybe, just maybe, we're not simply living the move of God. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 8, starting verse 1. And I want to talk about the necessity of a push today. The necessity of a push. I can feel a push happening this morning. All I could focus on this morning was a push. I walked in here today, and I'm so glad that now I, I can actually, you know, I, I used to be getting up at, you know, 5.45, 5, 5 in the morning, and uh, 5.30 in the morning, and just and getting up and having to come up and help set it up and everything like that. And recently I was told, you need to stop doing that. You need to stay home. Now, that's very hard for me. E even this morning, you know, I was up already at 7, and I was like, man, I want to, I want to go there already but God was like no 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 you need to you need to get you need to get get quiet and, and and I got quiet and I'll tell you it helped because God started downloading stuff for me this morning and he told me today was going to be a push day it was going to be a push it was going to be a day that we were going to push
And I want to talk to you about the necessity of a push today. But I want to start in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And I'm going to read the first four verses. It says this, Saul, who would later become Paul, was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. You ever have a time in your life before you look so churchified? There was a time in your life when you agreed completely with everything that was not of God? <laughs> I mean, we like to act like we didn't, right? Well, all of us got that time where we, where we used to act that way. And Paul had one of those moments. Paul had one of them days. And Saul was a witness, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. We like to have revisionist history and say, well, you know, even when I was in the world, I, even when I was on my own, I, you know, I, I still knew that I had conviction in me. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, there were moments in high school where I totally, I totally was not thinking about Jesus. <laughs> a great wave of per persecution began that day sweeping over the church of Jerusalem and all the believers except the apostles were scattered to the regions of Judea and Samaria. Great persecution started that day. All the believers were scattered. That sounds pretty bad. That's a bad day. How many of you would say that's a bad day? <laughs> the day persecution comes to your life, adversity like you've never experienced before enters your life and you get scattered where you were once all together. You held it together. Your life was all together. And then all of a sudden, what was once all together and your life was just where you wanted, all of a sudden it just poof, explodes. And, and, and that's a bad day. And some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. That's a really bad day. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. That's a really, really, really bad day. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. Circumstantially, this is the worst moment in the life of the early church. The early church had never experienced persecution until this day. They thought they experienced persecution. They got called before the council a bunch of times. They got called before the Jews a bunch of times. They were threatened with death. They were threatened with jail. And they thought that was bad, but they really didn't know adversity until they felt it that day. See, in America, we really don't know what persecution is. We come every Sunday and we bellyache and we moan and we groan and we complain about how awful our lives are, how we feel alone and abandoned by God, but you still have a home to live in. You're you're still clothed, you're still eating, and you're still free to be here on Sunday. That's a whole lot more than most believers around the world get to do. And you think what you're going through is persecution. Let me tell you something. It's persecution of your own mind. There is no such thing as persecution for the believer in America. So stop saying it. Stop lying. You're not persecuted. None of you had to Hide your way through lying down in the trunk of a friend's car, dropping you off by the side of the road there as they speed off somewhere else. You didn't have to run behind houses and go down into an underground basement to try to worship. You don't, you don't live your life in terror every day that somebody might find out who you are. See, you think you know what persecution is, but you don't. And we talk big in America like we'll give our lives to Jesus. But I'm not so sure that most of us know what that's like or would be willing to do that. And this day was a day unlike any other. This was the day it all exploded. And it wasn't Peter who made it happen. It wasn't John who made it happen. It wasn't James who made it happen. It wasn't any of the apostles. It was a deacon. It was a guy who was just tasked to serve in a menial way, just help feed people, help, help resource people. That's all he was there, but he was full of the Holy Spirit. I want God to raise up a generation of ordinary men and women who don't need a position or a title. You just want to be filled with the heart of God and the fire of his spirit and just ordinary everyday people doing everyday jobs will set this world on fire. You don't need to be a missionary. You just need to be a barista at Starbucks. You don't need to be a preacher with a mic.
You just need to be a waiter with a life altered by God. And this day, this was the day the church was going to find out what it was made of. This was the day the movement was going to find out what it's made of. There is coming a day where the movement is going to have to figure out what we're made of. There's a moment coming where you're going to have to figure out whether this is just good old-fashioned, ordinary American religion like we're used to, or you're really going to give your life for this thing. And I don't mean that means that someday somebody's going to come with a gun and put it to your head. That's not what I'm talking about. But every day you are given a situation where you can take a stand for the gospel. And it may not be a physical gun to your head saying, if you take a stand, I'll kill you. But the enemy is putting up the fear gun to your head and saying, if you say a word, my fear, you're gonna, the fear is going to kill you. What if they laugh at you? What if they what if they they make fun of you? Y'all might not be amening me, but they're amening me. So they were scattered. They were being hunted down. They were being destroyed. Drug out to prison. But verse 4, it says, but the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. I want to talk to you about the necessity of a push. See, God is always moving. That's why we're the movement. God is always moving. God never stops moving. God never stops proceeding. And our job is not to figure out the pace. Our job is to keep up with him. He's the pace setter, not me. I don't get to set the pace. I just get to match the pace. And every one of us requires a push because it is human nature to want to settle wherever you're comfortable. And in America, where everything is based on comfort, it is really easy to settle. We will settle. Some of us will settle at a higher place than other people will settle. And we think that we're doing really good just because our settling place is higher than other people's. But, but every one of us has a propensity to settle. And that becomes a problem when you serve a God who never settles. That's a problem when you serve a God who's always moving. He ne- he's never impressed by the last thing he did. God does not ever do something great in your life and go, wow, that was really, wow, I really outdid myself. I kind of shocked myself. I can't believe I actually pulled that off. I was kind of, you know, crossing my fingers for a minute there. I didn't know how it was going, but it worked out. Woo, we better not push it any further. We'll just, that's good. God never settles, but we will settle. So there's a conflict between my propensity to settle and God's unwillingness to settle. And in that space, God has to make up that deficit for me somehow. And the way that he does it is through a push. God will always consistently push you. You know, when I first started dating Stacy, if you don't know anything about Stacy, you need to know this. This girl, this girl, I'll tell you, this girl, she's the best student I've ever met in my life. I mean, she was valedictorian. I don't mean that she was a 4.0 student. She was first in her class at every level of schooling she ever went to, all the way to higher education. First in her class, not second, not, not, you know, not one of the valedictorians. She was first in her class. Yeah, I mean. (laughs) 
And Stacy does not, not only does she not ever want to get a B, she doesn't even want to miss a class. She went to every class when she was sick. Now, I love to achieve. I just hated sitting in class because I got bored a lot. I would always ace my test and I would be like, hey, if I'm going to, I'm going to read. I love reading. I love studying. I love learning. And if I could do that on my own, why do I need to come to class? I hated going to class. And before I met Stacy, I would just go to class, not go to class. But I would ace my test. And I thought that was good enough. But then I met Stacy Ford, Stacy Ann Ford. And for her, it wasn't enough to just ace the test. I'm like, it's good enough. I'm acing the test. She's like, no, Chris, you need to go to class. And so there'll be days where I wouldn't want to go to class. And I'd be like, hey, let's go hang out. And she's like, aren't you supposed to be in class right now? Nah, I mean, it's a beautiful day. I'm not going to go to class. And I wanted my awesome girlfriend to be like, okay, let's go hang out, Chris. But no. She's like, you need to go to class. And if you don't, you're not going to hang out with me. I'm like, what? But that's the whole reason why I don't want to go to class. I want to hang out with you. Nope, you're not going to hang out with me. And if you're going to do that, just don't, don't, don't even worry about it. You don't, you we just won't, I'm not even going to hang out with you for the rest of the week. What? What? That's so, what? That's unfair. Why? And then she would just be on me and on me and on me about it. Are you going to go? Are you going to You better go. You gonna... I may not have gone that day, but you know what? I started, there, there were days when I really didn't want to go. And I would hear Stacy's voice in my head. I would literally hear it. And I'd be like, oh, I better go. Not because I was afraid of not failing. Because I was afraid of making her mad. And I wanted to have a good week. I wanted to go on a date. I wanted to hang out in the quad later that day. And all of a sudden, a decision I might not have made by myself, I made. Why? Because I had a push. And God has to push each and every one of us. So I want to give you some principles today about the push. Every single one of you is at a plateau right now. Whether you've been there for one day or you've been there for years, every level you get to. Think about that. The word level means a plateau. That's what level means. If it's not level, it's at an incline one way or the other. But if it's level, it's perfectly flat. That's a plateau. Every level you get to is a plateau. You're you're intended to get there. You're not intended to stay there. And I want to show you how if you can understand what God is doing in your life through some of the tough, unlikable, unfun things in your life right now. I can show you how to get to the next level in the next few minutes. Are you ready to go with me? All right. So I want to talk to you about, I want to give you a few principles first about, about the push. Number one, every level requires a push. Every level requires a push. Isaiah 55, 8 through 10 says this, my thoughts are nothing. Everyone say nothing. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. That's pretty sobering to those of us who think we're just as smart as God. (laughs) He doesn't say my thoughts are a little bit better than yours. My thoughts are a little more advanced. My thoughts, well, we're kind of in the same ballpark. He says my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. So stop thinking you can think with me. Stop strategizing with me. Stop negotiating. Why are you negotiating with me? Why are you thinking we're in partnership on this plan? 
My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, said the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Not only are my thoughts above what you can think, my thoughts are far beyond the realm that is beyond your ability to think. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So he says, okay, so his thoughts... This is God talking. My thoughts are above your thoughts. And he says, they're so much higher, they're nothing like the way you think. Because just as the heavens are higher than the earth, So are my thoughts so much higher than your thoughts and my ways so much higher than your ways. Now, thoughts and ways are two different things. Thoughts are are ideas, but ways are directions. I can think it would be really awesome... It would be really awesome to take a trip to Europe. That's a great thought. But how am I going to get there? Those are ways. Is everybody with me? Not only are God's thoughts for you, the things that he wants for you, not only do you have to trust God because what he wants for you is way better than what you want for you. So if you ever want to achieve things that are far beyond what you can imagine, you have to trust him in that. But you've actually also got to trust him in the way that he's going to get you there. And to me, a lot of times, it's not, the struggle is not in us being able to trust him with our thoughts and his thoughts because we like his ideas better than our ideas. We like what he thinks about us more than the way we think about ourselves. We like the things that he has for us and his promises for us. We love those things. So we don't really, really struggle with the idea of not fighting him over his thoughts but where we really struggle with is is fighting him over his ways but he says you can't trust me in my promises and not trust me in my process man the thing is I can only be the best at what is within my power. And all I have power to do is think on this level. That's it. That's it. I have no ability to think higher than this. That's why God's thoughts are so much higher and his ways are so much higher. Why? Because I cannot. It is not an issue of will. I literally cannot think for myself and in myself above this level. I will always think on this level and be on this level. So the problem is God wants me to think on this level, but I only have power to think on this level. How do I get there? How do I get from from here to here? How do I get there? Well, how does an airplane get from here to here? How does a space shuttle get from here to here? It needs a push. That push comes in the form most most often in the form of propulsion. Fire. An explosion, basically. Every new level. Every new level you want to get to in God, you need a push. And let me tell you, once you get here and once you start thinking on this level, all of a sudden, wherever, wherever you reside is earth, right? Earth, earth is the place of man's dominion. It's the place that we live. So everywhere that you, you do like the Lord's Prayer and whatever is done in heaven is done on earth, whatever level of heaven's thinking you take on, that becomes your new earth. Because that's where you live now. 
But God, now you're not on equal footing with God. Because as soon as this comes to your earth, as long as God's, God is God's, his thoughts are higher than yours and his ways are higher than yours. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are all his ways higher than your ways, his thoughts higher than your thoughts. And even as you get, even as you start to mature in Christ and your understanding comes to a different level and it becomes your dwelling place, there's always another level to get to. And you always need a push. Every new level requires a push. Number two, God will push you whenever you become complacent, which is often. <laughs> we like to be spiritual and act like it's not often, but it's often. God will push you whenever you become complacent. Whenever you decide that where you are is enough, God will push you. Number three. The harder the push, the further you'll go. <laughs> Brandon, come up with me for a second. All right. I want you to stand right here. All right. Now, this is the interesting thing about a push. All right. Pushes come in all kinds of different speeds. Pushes do not come in different forms. In other words, a push is this. That's a push. A push will always be like that. That's always what a push will be. You can't change what a push is. It just, it just is. It's a push. But the way that you change a push is by the force and by the velocity of it. Is everybody with me? So if I push Brandon like this, why are you smiling at me like that, Brandon? <laughs> Notice I picked a guy of, like, comparable size who can't beat me up later on without a fight, right? Oh, oh, he brought a knife. All right. All right. <laughs> Huali, come on up. You can go down. <laughs> so this is a push. Now, without much work, look, it doesn't move anything. But say I push a little harder. Right? Say I push a lot harder. <laughs> The harder the push, the further he goes. Thank you. The problem with the harder push is we all go, wow, that sounds amazing. God, push me as hard as you want to push, right? God, do whatever you got to do. I want to go as far and as fast as you'll take me, God. How many of you have prayed that prayer? God, do whatever you have to do. I want to go as far as you want me to go. How many of you ever prayed that? You had no idea what you're praying. This message is for you. You had no idea what you're praying. Because the farther you want to go, the harder God's got to push. The problem is, the harder the push, the more you resist. <laughs> Notice he didn't resist me when I just tapped him like that. But the harder he was anticipating the push, what did he do? We never rehearsed this. I just picked him right now. Never discussed with him what we were doing. But notice, as he was anticipating the harder push, what did he naturally start to do? What was he doing? He was bracing himself. Why? He was ready to resist the harder push. And the harder the push, the more uncomfortable and unpleasant and painful it is. So the more likely you are to resist it. And some of us are praying prayers and saying, God... Push me as hard as you need to push me. I'm ready to go as far as you want to go. But as soon as God answers your prayer and he says, well, if you want me to go, as, if you want me to take you as far as I can take you, I got to push you as hard as I can push you. And as soon as you start feeling that push, your first initial reaction is to resist him as hard as you can. And you set your feet in the ground and say, God, it's not supposed to be like this. God, that's not what I really wanted. God, that's not really what I prayed for. God, why, aren't you, why are you doing this to me? God, this is, no, God, 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 why, no, no, God, no, I want to go far, but why, why, is, why are you doing it? Devil, devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. The devil, you will not push me from. I am immovable. I am unshakable. I will stand right here I ain't going nowhere in the spirit of God and God is on the other side going man what the heck are you doing <laughs> wow. 
Which brings me to number four. You stop moving whenever, whenever you start resisting the push. <laughs> Some of us are not stuck because the enemy is pushing against us. Some of us are stuck because we're pushing against God. The enemy has no power to stop you. I want you to understand this. The enemy has no power to stop you. Stop blaming the enemy for things he does not have power over in your life. What power does darkness have over the light when you flip that switch? What power does evil have over good? What power does the ant have over the elephant? Why are you giving the enemy so much credit for things he has no power over? He who the sun sets free is truly free. I talked last week, I mentioned the synagogue of freed slaves. You are not freed slaves. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I am a new creation. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, I'm a new creation. What that means is God didn't set me free by taking the slave out of the cell. He set me free by killing the slave and resurrecting the free man. It wasn't that I was a slave and now I'm set free. The truth is if I'm in Christ, I was never a slave. Stop saying the enemy. If you're stuck, the enemy does not have the power to stick you where you are. And God has to raise up a people who will stop blaming and playing the victim over everything that doesn't go right. And you realize that the power of God lives in you and I'm going to keep moving. And if there's adversity that's coming against me, it is not because it's the enemy destroying me. God has allowed it in my life. The enemy might be behind it. Life might be behind it. Sin might be behind it. My flesh might be behind it. But God allows it not to destroy me, but because I need a push. You can't build big muscles by lifting air. You need resistance. And the greater the resistance, the bigger the muscles. Some of us want big muscles. But we'd rather not lift the weights. So we come every Sunday trying to shoot up Holy Ghost like spiritual steroids. You think you're holy, you're just juicing. We just because we're swollen up in our muscles and look in the mirror and we look good because we're juicing Holy Spirit like steroids, we think we're awesome and you can't even lift nothing without throwing your back out. Because like the last days in 1 Timothy, like Paul said, we got a form of godliness and none of the power. And God is looking for weightlifting believers who can lift some adversity over your head. And the more adversity comes to you, the more you're like, that's more weights for me to lift. Number five, a push pressure test your passions. The push, pressure, tension, time, passions. There's a lot of things you think you're passionate about, but as soon as the push comes, you give up. You know what that means? You weren't really passionate about it. You said you were, but you really weren't. If you can easily give up on a dream, it wasn't a dream. It was a fantasy. Some of you are asking God to make your dreams come true, and all it is is a fantasy. And every time adversity comes, you abandon it. But the push, pressure test your passions. 
it's necessary to figure out what is really in you and what's just a fantasy. Number six, you can't be the source of your own push. This is my favorite one. Try it. Try pushing yourself in the back. Try it. Try pushing yourself forward. You can't. You can't. How many of you think you, how many of you understand this? You can't push yourself. How many of you understand this? Then why do the majority of believers in America think that they don't need a mentor? Why do most of us abandon anyone who dares to push us and say, well, I can push myself, just me and Holy Ghost? God will always send someone or something else to push you. You can't be your own push. Stop acting like you can do it on your own. You can't. So how does God push you? Number one, divine encounters. You'll come in here. Some of you this morning, this is why I wanted to jump right into it. You came up here. What was that? That was a push. And I knew, I knew I couldn't just pray a prayer with you. High five your neighbor, go sit down, take up offering. I needed to give you some definition to what's happening in your life. That was a push. That was the first push. That was a divine encounter that became your push. Encounters with God. Sometimes it's a dream. Sometimes it's a revelation. Sometimes it's, it's, it's word as it's being spoken. Sometimes it's a mo moment in worship. Sometimes it's driving your car and God arrests your heart. It's a push. Number two, a mentor or a teacher. If you're unwilling to take up mentorship in your life, you'll never get to the next level. And if God has given you a spiritual father or mentor in your life, you need to value and honor them with everything in you. And I'll tell you why. Paul says you have many teachers, but you have few fathers. I have many teachers in my life, but I have one father. I have many, many spiritual people that I draw from, books I read. But I have few spiritual fathers. Mentors push you. And it never feels good. They're always going to push you harder than you want. Number three, opportunity. Opportunity is a great push. Some of you know you need to make a change because you know where you are. You can't reach the opportunities that are there for you. And so you got to change careers. You got to push harder. You got to get more schooling. Whatever it is, that's a push. Number four, adversity. Adversity is a push. These last two, adversity and the next one, these are the ones we resist a lot. We don't really resist opportunity. We don't really resist an encounter with God. We resist mentors. We resist adversity. As soon as adversity comes, we are trained that if it feels good, it's God. If it feels bad, it's the enemy. So as soon as something good happens, we go, bless God. As soon as something bad happens, we go, oh, I, buy, I rebuke the enemy. But sometimes we are rebuking God when he brings adversity into our life. And we are blessing the enemy when he brings good in our life. One of the enemy's greatest strategies in your life is at the point that he knows God wants to push you to the next level, he brings you lots of really good stuff to keep you where you are, to keep you from moving with him. He tells you, oh, it'll be, it'll be good over here. It's good enough. Or if God wants you to stay where you are, that's the way he's moving in your life. He brings up good stuff. He starts piling good stuff. And, and he makes the grass greener on the other side to your perception. And you go, oh, see, I mean, that would be good. I mean, that would still be good. You always know, you always know which side you're not supposed to go to because that's the side you start to bargain with God over. Right? 
when you're where God wants you to be, it's just obedience or disobedience. You're either making a simple decision of, ah, I don't want to, or I'm going to go. But, the, but when you start advocating for the place you want, you going, well, God, but, but, but I know, but this would be good, and this would be good, and this would be all right, and this would still be the same, and this would be sort of like it. Boom. The compromise is in the negotiation. Because you never negotiate unless you're wanting to compromise. Man, that was for somebody right now. That is truth right there. And finally, regret. Regret is a push. Mistakes you've made that you wish you wouldn't have, they can be a great push in your life if you allow them to play the role that they play. God will allow you to make mistakes, not so that you'll be condemned by them, but so that we can learn. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, uh, 13 to 15 says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Other translations say, I press on towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's always higher. Heaven's higher than the earth. His thoughts higher than my thoughts. His ways higher than my ways. And I've got to press higher. But the one thing I have to do is I have to put the failures of my past behind me so I can move ahead. So I was thinking about, I was meditating on that. This is my life passage, by the way. Philippians 3, 4, 13 and 14. And, 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 and putting things behind me. That word doesn't mean forgetting as in I just forgot one day but it means to put it behind me and when I put something behind me and I have something in front of me and I push it behind me well that reminds me of being in the water and swimming and if I want to propel myself forward I've got to swim I got to stroke like that but you know when I'm stroking I'm not actually pushing myself forward I'm pushing the water back I'm taking the water that's in front of me and I'm pushing the water back. I'm pushing it and by pushing the water back, I'm not actually pushing the water behind me, I'm pushing myself forward by making the motion of pushing the water back. And just like that swimmer who pushes the water back to propel himself forward, you propel yourself forward in Christ every time you take the pass and put it behind you. Man, this... Every day, His mercies are new. Every day, Yesterday was in the back. And whether it was successful or the failure, I just keep swimming. I just keep pushing the past behind me. And as I continually do this every day, every single day, I don't need to focus on anything else. I don't need any other motion. It's very simple. I just push the past behind me. Push the past behind me. And every day I push the past behind me. And all I do is swim forward. All I do is move forward. Why? Because I'm pressing on towards the end of the race. I'm pressing on by pushing it behind me. By pushing it be And some of us got to learn. Right now you're treading water and you're wasting a lot of motion just trying to keep yourself afloat. And you say, Pastor Chris, how? How do I do this? How? I'm tired. I'm about to drown. I just feel like I'm staying afloat. And God is saying to you, hey, you don't have to do anything else but you just got to start putting the past behind you. Take your hands and start pushing it behind you. Push it right now Push it behind you. Look forward. Push it behind you. Push it behind you. Start swimming again. Start moving again. Start racing again. Just start putting it behind you. That's the one thing you got to do is you just got to put it behind you. Cup those hands again. Get back. Put your head back in the water. You're not going to drown and start swimming. Again, push that water. Push that path. Push it. Push it. Push it. Push it. I know it was bad yesterday. Push it behind you. I know that it was rough yesterday. Push it behind you. I know that it was awesome and you want to stay right here because this is the best place you've ever been in Christ. But push it behind you. I know that you love where you are right now. I know you love the name God's house and you're like, why do we have to change the movement? But guess what? God's always moving. Push it behind you. Push it behind you. I know you love where you are in that job and you wish you could just stay right here. But God is calling you to be a part of his 
movement and you can't stay where you are, push it behind you. Just push it behind you. I know you were an addict yesterday and I know you were an addict the day before that, but today's a new day. Push it behind you. I know alcoholism runs in your family and I know that everyone in your family has been an alcoholic all of their life and you're afraid your children are going to be an alcoholic too, but push it behind you. I know that you failed as a husband or a wife and your marriage is on the brink and I know that as you came to church this morning you were thinking bad thoughts but push it behind you. I know the church hurt you. I know pastors have hurt you. I know people have gossiped about you. I know that people have lied about you and I know it's hard for you to ever trust in a body of believers ever again but today is a new day. Push it behind you because there's a race there's a race that you're running and you got to press on and you got to push forward because you you are going to make it yeah yeah somebody should just somebody should just rejoice in that you are going to make it you just got to push it behind you you got to push the past behind you you got to take your hand you got to push it behind you everybody stand up on your feet When you swim, when you swim and you push that water, and where that water in front of you that you reached for it, where that water was and you pushed it, and now you propel yourself forward and you occupy the very same place that water was a second ago. It's a principle called displacement. Displacement. And the prefix dis, D-I-S, means not or un. You unplace something so God can place you in that place. God can only replace you if you allow him to displace you first. The prefix re, R-E, means again. Anytime you see re, it's again. Re, represent, means to present again. So to replace you and displace you, it literally means that if God, if you want God to again place you. You're here, but you want him to place you there. You want him to place you again and again and again and again. Then you have to constantly be willing for him to unplace you where you are. But the problem is, some of us have dug our heels in and said, I'm not moving. I am not moving. I'm going to stay right where I am. So if you're here today, I know we had an altar call already. But I believe what God wants to give you a different kind of push today. Some of you got a push, but there are other, others of us that need a different push. Two of my, my daughters, my younger daughter's best friends, the Brigettes, our children's pastors, their kids came over and they brought a game called Mario Party. And there's this way you can play the game where you're rowing. The four of you are rowing down a river and you got to, you got to row and there's two on each side and you got to work together to row. And then you got to go side to side, up and down, faster and slower to get certain things before the time runs out. And they were yelling at each other when they were playing. And I came out to referee the fight and find out what was going on. And it was because there's four of them and they're not going anywhere. They're hitting the rocks. Not because they're not rowing. They're all rowing their own way. And they're yelling at each other. No, Jay. No, Noelani. 
Stop, Kayana. Stop, Alyssa. It was a hot mess. And I said, look, it's not going to work unless one of you is the leader and gives the direction that everyone else just follows. So then all four of them go, I'm the leader, I'm the leader, I'm the leader, and they start yelling out stuff. And I said, no, 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 no. Only one of you can be the leader. So I said, Noelani, you tell them. You be the leader. So she would tell them, left side, row. Right side, row. Row with me. Row with me. Row. 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 She set the cadence. Row. Row. And everybody had to row with her. And the rule was you row when I row. You row when I row. You push when I push. You go when I go. And when they started working together, they started to move as long as they followed direction. See, there are some of us in here. God is the only leader. That's it. That's it. He's not going to negotiate that. But some of us, God is saying, row, row now, row, row when I row, stop rowing. And some of us are going, well, I don't think we're going fast enough. I'd rather row this way. But God, I don't like that direction. I'm going to go this way. And you're rowing against God and you're not getting anywhere and you're getting, you're getting smashed against a rock. But I want to tell you today, somebody's got to push when God pushes. God is telling you push. He wants you to push. When adversity comes, it's a push. You push. Just like a woman in labor who's about to have a baby, when she starts contraction, contracting, the doctor says, now push, now push, now push. It's time to push. You got to push when he pushes. Some of us, God's got to get us in line with his push. And if that's you today, you say, you know what, God? I've been pushing, but I've been pushing at my own cadence. I've been doing it my own way. I have not been following the leader. I am tired of treading water. I am ready to put the past behind me. I'm ready to look forward to what's ahead. I'm ready to go with your push. If that's you, I want you to join me up here right now. Just come on. This is your push. I'm not going to beg you. This is your push. This is your push. You got to go with this push. If you felt the Holy Spirit tugging on you right now, that's your push. That's your push. This is your push.